this left turn was obviously made for locks. I was a halfback, so I can't see the guys right in front here, but I'll do the best I can. First of all, uh, you will notice that my accent is a little strange. Uh, don't be fooled by that. Uh, I am the most fanatical All Blacks supporter and have been for the last 30 years when we first came to New Zealand in 1987. In fact, my wife is still suspicious. She believes the reason we came to New Zealand was the first World Cup. Um, <clears throat> I've been asked to speak to you today on character, integrity, and leadership. Three very big subjects. But I've been given 15 minutes to cover these three very big subjects. So I'm going to tell you two stories. That's right, two stories to cover three very big subjects. Now the one story is about a hero of ancient times, and the other one about a 13-year-old boy whose life was transformed by the first story. The stories are intertwined, so I'll be using flashbacks just like they do in the movies. Now, my wife and I and our eldest daughter were in Rome over Easter. And we saw all the main attractions, <clears throat> St. Peter's, the Vatican Museum, the Spanish Steps, the Colosseum, the Pantheon, and so on. But they were surprised when I told them I wanted to stand on the Sublation Bridge. Like most visitors to Rome, they'd never heard of the Sublation Bridge. But they agreed to walk with me down the left bank of the Tiber to a modern crossing known as Ponte Sublicio. And there we stood in the place where the first story played out two and a half thousand years ago. Some people call it a myth, some believe it was an actual historical event. But all have to accept the fact that the story inspired not only the ancient Romans, but people all over the world for more than 2,000 years. It goes like this. The people of ancient Rome were angered by the injustices foisted on them by their king, Tarquin the Proud. And so they drove him out of the city and set up the Roman Republic. Now Tarquin was an Etruscan and he appealed to his own people who held the lands to the north of Rome to help him take the city back by force. At that early stage in Roman history, the Etruscans enjoyed a military superiority over the Romans and it looked like the Roman Republic would be short-lived. The Romans destroyed all the bridges across the Tiber because Rome at that stage was only on the south eastern bank of the Tiber. It didn't extend um, onto the north western bank as it does today. So they destroyed all the bridges except one, <coughs> over which they sent their citizen army to face the advancing Etruscans. Sadly, the Romans disgraced themselves that day, and they started running away before any serious fighting had been done. The panic spread, and soon the whole army was fleeing back across the Tiber, across this narrow bridge, the Sublition Bridge. Only one man tried to stop them. Horatius, nicknamed Cocles, because he had lost an eye, in a previous battle defending Rome. He pleaded with his countrymen to show courage and loyalty and to defend their families and their city. But no one heard him. And so Horatius stood at the entrance to the bridge on the far side from Rome, facing the Etruscans on his own. The narrow bridge meant he only had to fight three at a time, but it obviously looked as though he wouldn't last very long. At that stage, two 
no Roman nobles, ashamed of their cowardice, went across the bridge to try and help Horatius. And the Etruscans were unable to get past these three men. Meanwhile, behind them, the, Ro the other Romans were dismantling the bridge. And when the dismantling was almost complete, Horatius sent the two, his two com comrades back over the bridge and he stood alone facing the Etruscans again. Once the bridge collapsed into the river Tiber, the Etruscans saw Horatius was alone and so they rushed at him. And he jumped armour and all into the raging torrent of the Tiber below and the river swept him downstream to the bank on the far side. One man's character had saved the Roman Republic. I first read the story of Horatius in a Latin class when I was 13 years old in Broken Hill, Northern Rhodesia, places you've probably ne never heard of before. <coughs> Well, Broken Hill, Northern Rhodesia, was in Central Africa. Today, it is the city of Kabwe in Zambia, still in Central Africa. And the story made an indelible impression on my life. Not only had Horatius been courageous, but he had shown enormous self-control in a very dangerous situation. He refused to surrender to injustice and he had the practical wisdom to know precisely what to do in the crisis. Now, I don't pretend to be any kind of hero, but the example of Horatius inspired me in a life filled with challenges and all sorts of crises. I've been an exile. I've been a refugee and I've been an immigrant, so I know what it's like to lose things. I fought a war, and I know what it's like to lose one's homeland. Imagine if New Zealand suddenly stopped existing, what it would mean in your lives. Well, I lost my home. I've enjoyed success as a teacher, a creative director in the glossy world of advertising and as a marketing and management consultant. I'm now, I'm now a leadership consultant, an international columnist and an author. Horatius taught me the difference character can make in a life full of trials. Our word character comes from the Greek word character which meant a stamping tool, a device for marking or branding something. And so character for us today means the self-chosen stamp we put on our own developing personalities. Remember I said it's self-chosen. Nobody else chooses. You and I choose for ourselves. We are responsible for who we are. And we all know the difference between good character and bad character. Your school, made great by its own heroic struggles and its dedicated service to young men like you, defines good character in its motto and its values. And those values echo the virtues of Horatius. Just four, which lead to all the other virtues. Practical wisdom, justice, courage, and self-control. You see, each of us is responsible for the type of person we are. That is our character. And it is character that is the foundation of integrity and leadership. If your character isn't good, you will never have integrity, and you will never be a leader. 
So regardless of the many influences in our lives, the choice of what to think, what to say, and what to do in any and every situation is our own. In everything you do today, today, you will be shaping your character for better or for worse. And shaping it for the better is usually very hard work. But it is always worth it. That's why the positive environment provided by your school is such an immense gift to all of you. <coughs> Nihil Boni Sine Labore. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Heerden, sir, for coming here and sharing your stories with us, the stories of Horatius and what Horatius and his character can teach us and our school values. So I'd now like to present this gift to you as a token of our appreciation on behalf of Palmy Boys. Thank you very much. <laughs>